Welcome back, everybody, to GPCE seminar series. And we're glad to, to restart this for the summer. And I'll just uh, turn it over to Anil, who can introduce our speaker for today. Thanks, Bilda. So, uh, welcome, everyone. It's a great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Mark Kaur, for today's seminar. So Mark's training is originally in cognitive psychology, but he's worked in many different areas after that, including epidemiology and complex systems, specifically understanding dynamic processes and drivers of risky behavior and decision-making in a public health context. And uh, he's applied this in projects from uh, numerous uh, federal agencies before. Great fit for uh, our project. So Mark, please go ahead. Thank you, Neil. The title is Behavior Matters, Whatever Next, Computational Psychology for Computational Epidemiology. And the idea is that, and I'm not going to argue that behavior matters or not, I think for epidemics and for COVID-19, for example, I think there's evidence that it does. And we could argue that in another talk, and I'd be happy to. But we're going to assume that it does. And the idea is then, so what do we do about it? How do we think about um, modeling it? And how do we think about modeling large-scale systems with computational agents that are psychologically grounded um, in the epidemiological context? So this is a project that's funded by NSF and IARPA, a lot of the work recent, very recently. We're st- I think our IARPA is still going on. Um, there was an NSF rapid that came out for COVID. But it's also an extension of some of the work we've done for DARPA in the social sim program from 2017 to, to, I guess, this this winter, the the contract ended, which is really about computational psychology and large-scale social systems, in particular and primarily uh, on social media. So the team here represents all three of these different projects. You can see UVA. They're bolded, so you can see those. Mark Orr, Pranta Bhattacharya, Baltazar Espinoza, Stephen Eubank, and Fenchel Mann. I hope I didn't miss anybody. The rest come from different places, Carnegie Mellon, IHMC, University of Washington, Rensselaer Polytechnic, and Duke. Before I start, I guess I'll just say my approach was to try to show a lot of kind of a high-level set of examples of how we can think about modeling social systems from a psychological perspective. And... And at the end, I'm going to try to just show some of the work that's thinking about doing this at scale in the epidemiological context. So that's it. I have so much material. I guess I want to warn people. There's a lot of details. Some of the studies I'm going to show you. The, I'm trying to emphasize the important pieces, but it's always about trying to put a certain kind of cognitive model, a computational psychological model, in the context of a social system. And in, in, for epidemiology, there's some work directly in, in the epidemiological context. So with that said, if you don't get all the details, it probably doesn't matter that much. We can talk about it, but there's so much in here that if you have questions for clarity, that's fine. Please ask them. But don't feel pressed to understand the details. Try to get the high level piece. That would help me because <laughs> then I don't have to you know, worry too much about the details because there is a lot of them. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to make it easy for you. And I apologize for that too, but I, I couldn't figure another way to do it because I wanted to get a lot of material in. So anyway, with those caveats, let me start. Okay. So the outline, we're just going to go over kind of a framework. It's, it's very brief, a little philosophical. I won't bore you with it. Just to give a sense of where our work lies in the in the space of behavioral modeling itself there's lots of ways to model human behavior and there's people in this group who do it in different ways than we do it and tell you about our current approach in that framework and i'm going to show you three examples of some small systems that we've been working on one is epidemiological two are just social systems and that's to give examples of what we mean by computational psychology and how we think about integrating it into social systems. And then finally, I, I will provide maybe 15 minutes about at scale epidemiological modeling with these kinds of psychological agents. So the framework and approach, I don't want to be too philosophical, but I get stuck on this. I've seen a lot of different kinds of methods for modeling you know, human behavior. And this large space, there's not really, you know, your options if you want to do this. There's not a systematic list of what you get if you pick a certain method. But it's important to think about the method that you use and how you build evidence for the modeling approach and empirical evidence in some way that what we're concerned with in terms of ep- epidemics, at the end of the day, we're concerned with human behavior. 
how do we build evidence that any approach we use is really going to help? And there's different kinds of evidence. The framework is just to think about the fact that there's different kinds of theory. So I'm blessed by the you know, universe to work with all kinds of, of types who think about behavior of systems. So physicists, mathematicians, and graph theorists, computer scientists, psychologists, sociologists, demographers, anthropologists, you name it, um, political scientists, and so forth. The distinction of theory, it's really just important because it, it confuses people. Theory means different things for different places. And with what theory means, the evidence that you use to to believe or not a theory changes. So, I mean, a real, not to be simplistic, but in math, you build evidence through proofs. And in science, you build experiments and you keep testing against empirical data, your theory, which may be a mathematical theory, but the proof isn't part of the, the adjudication of the theories. And it's interesting because just in the space of theory and human behavior, you can find intersections like game theory and graph theory that, and I'm not a graph theorist or game theorist, that some of the value of that theoretical approach is derived partly from the mathematical results that exist. And you want to question whether that's good or not. You don't necessarily, I'm not saying it's not good. I'm just saying these kinds of, the framework I'm trying to provide here is just to think, well, if the results are really strong under these conditions, and this tells us something about constraints on a system, that's very useful. But does that system have anything to do with human behavior whatsoever? Just for clarity, I think it's important to think about that. The next piece is agency. I think we're going to agree to some degree that we're, we're assuming some, some kind of agency in the sense that these things that are represented of humans or groups of humans or other agents that affect humans, they have purpose and potentially goals. And you don't necessarily have to model those goals. You can model from the inside or the outside, which is, I don't know if people are familiar with Herb Simon's The Sciences of the Artificial, but he makes a nice case for thinking about inside and outside. It's some of the artificial barrier, but, you know, the details of the decision processes of agency and the memory processes and the control processes or not. You can think about just the outside, like, for example, from a certain economic perspectives where you're really looking at the relation between input and output or some deep learning methods that look at social systems. They don't necessarily model the inside and they don't need to. And that leads you to scale, which is you can model thousands or millions of agents at once from the inside or the outside, assuming agency of some sort, but not modeling it really. I think thinking about the scale there's subtle issues about scale and validation or, or building empirical evidence for your models with respect to humans in the sense that, just a really simple example, a single agent um, looking at the input-output relations of, a, of a, what I'll just call it a stimulus because I'm a psychologist and, and behavior, that might change if you have, say, a dyad where the input of one agent is the output of the other agent and so forth. Maybe the kinds of dynamics of the input outputs are dependent on the structure of the fact that it's a dyad. So scale might have to be accounted for properly with respect to whatever's on the inside of these agents. So the point is, if you pick a theory, you pick an inside-outside distinction in a scale, deciding how you evaluate evidence is really difficult. And I think this is at the root of the problem with moving forward for building really good models of human behavior and human systems in the epidemiological context and in social systems in general. So that's it for the philosophy. We'll move on to more practical matters, but I think all of this is highly practical. Our perspective in this space is cognitive architectures. If you're from the AI world, this is probably just a reminder, or you might know all this already, that's fine if you're not. It's a very particular approach um, to building generally intelligent systems. Cognitive architecture is like a computer architecture in a sense. It's a what we call in psychology a task-independent infrastructure. So it has an architecture. It has memory processing, control, represent representation of data, you know, input and output devices. And the way you actually show competence in a task or in a in a social situation is through learning mechanisms that have knowledge in a very broad sense that actually build and change knowledge structures. Cognitive modeling is the use of a cognitive architecture, because you don't have to do it this way, as the basis for human performance and behavior. And that's the space that we're in. So building cognitive models, using cognitive architectures as the basis, 
and building models that can do tasks and comparing them to humans. And we just have this phrase, architecture plus knowledge equals behavior. It's not my phrase, it's just something we borrowed. So the particular cognitive architecture that we build cognitive models from is called ACT-R. And it's something that's been around for, well, 1970s, it started as a theory of memory and it's, it's expanded quite a bit. And it's a very, relatively speaking, popular um, architecture for, especially for cognitive modeling with respect to human behavior. I guess the points I wanna make here, what you see on the right is a representation of the architecture and partly the relations between the architecture and certain uh, brain functionality and brain regions. We're not going to go over all the details, but the points that I want to make here is that ACTAR has been used, like I said, starting in the 70s. I mean, it wasn't ACTAR yet, but it was the, the, the kernel of it for the last, you know, just say 30 years, building an understanding of the architecture itself, not the models, but building models for tasks, the architecture itself has changed in a way that it, it's good at representing things like individual differences between people, different kinds of cognitive biases that affect all kinds of tasks, learning and training effects. The point I wanna make here, this is a, a very particular version of a cognitive modeling framework built on cognitive architectures that has been good at modeling Lots of experimental data in cognitive psychology and a little bit, and here's the caveat, in terms of social behavior, it wasn't developed by social psychologists. It was developed by, you know, AI people and psychologists who study tasks like chess or Tower of Hanoi or things like that. So, but it has had some success in the last 15 years or so, but in spurts and fits, there's been work on social games and some social behavior. And I'll show you some new work that we're doing in this domain. So that's the idea. This is our approach. Social behavior hasn't really been studied nearly as in, in as much detail. The idea of the architecture, just for a point, if you are an architecture type, you know, there's some argument to change the architecture, maybe if you start going really far afield into social dynamics. That's an unknown that I'd like to address one day if I ever had time. So our particular flavor of ACTAR we're using, it's kind of a modeling framework within the ACTAR community. It's called instance-based learning. And it's really a memory kind of thing. Like I said, it, there's a lot of details here, but I can just give you the overview. It's a model of human memory. It captures things like the, the decay rate you might have for remembering something and the effects of rehearsal, the effects of priming, which is priming is something, uh, for example, when you see a letter on your desk that you forgot about and you just walk by and you get a glimpse of it, all of a sudden you go in a different path mentally and you remember what the letter's for and you forgot to actually mail it five days ago and you might, you know, who knows what's going to happen. The other point I want to make about the IBL framework Besides what ACT-R catches, it, it's kind of a light computational framework that we use. We use something that's actually called ACT-UP, not ACT-R. It's a modular piece, and it allows you to take functions out of ACT-R with respect to, say, memory, decay, and so forth. And there's a bunch of other functions. We're not going to talk about the details of ACT-R because that will take another talk all by itself. But we pull those out, and it, it's really useful. We have a Python version and list version of this ACT-UP that allows you to modularly take pieces out and prune them in a sense to be less computationally complex for certain kind of scaling issues. That's pretty much it about the introduction to framework and so forth. So what we're going to do now is just look at a couple of simple systems. We have two papers that just came out, one on social exchange dynamics, one on polarization of attitudes. And Baltazar and I are working on economic decisions and epidemic. Point of showing you these, and I'm going to go pretty fast, but just to get the details, really to show you how ACTAR can be used in these social simulations, what this kind of approach might surface in terms of something novel that you couldn't see otherwise. First, look at social exchange. Just pretend this isn't about epidemics for the moment, because I think it's, I hope it's useful. This project, so John Morgan, Kristen LeBierre, Jim Moody, and myself, this is a paper that is in proceedings at SBP BRIMS. And John and Jim are sociologists, like pure bred sociologists. LeBierre is an architecture guy, and I'm me. So this was really driven. I've been working with Jim for a long time. And we've been trying to find a place to, to look at computational psychology in the context of sociology, in the context of something that sociologists care about. So social exchange is something they care about. And basically, you just think of social exchange. This is a godfather picture. And this other picture is a friend of mine who is stuck somewhere. And these are kinds of social exchange. One is, you know, favors and trading and giving gifts, but also acquiring debtors and 
calling those debts in and so forth. They're social. And sometimes you have things like just, it might seem altruistic, but something that's more like reciprocal exchange. You don't really know what's going on if you're going to get anything back, but someone needs help and you help them. And maybe you'll get help later. And the part that we're interested in in social exchange, because there's a long extensive literature I can't review now, which I don't know well anyway, is that how people learn about social exchange, how they actually learn the logics of social exchange isn't really well understood. And cognitive architectures are good at learning. So that was a starting point. But it also allowed us to think about what kind of cognitive mechanisms underlie social exchange itself. So those are the two main questions here. The history of it is social psychology was interested in this in the 60s and 70s. They wanted to know about this home and work here. They had propositions about behavior. So I won't go through all of them, but just for the first one, behavior that generates positive consequences is likely to be repeated. Second one, behavior has been rewarded in the past. We performed in similar situations, right? It sounds obvious. But for us, when we saw this talking to sociologists, we thought, okay, we can simulate that in ACT-R. Those are the kinds of things ACT-R can do well. In the 80s and probably in the 70s too, the sociologists thought about social exchange from a psychological perspective, and they just use it as a way of essentially describing how graphs end up in the structure they end up in, social graphs. So I think there's been a dialogue between social psych and sociology for a while in terms of what people do and how does it change social structure at the large, at the macro scale. In the 60s and 70s, there was a paradigm called the social exchange. I don't even know what it's called, actually, but I just call it the experimental paradigm to study exchange networks. And the idea is you can do experiments on small groups where you can see in the lower left, you have two different graphs. One is a triad and the other is a four cycle. What's nice about these, if you compare the two, is that you equalize local structure, but you change the global structure and the power dynamics are actually changed. What it means is, though, quickly, take A on the left in the high power group. A can exchange 12 points with B1 or B2. B1 and B2 can only exchange four points with each other and 12 points with A. So most of the time, people want to exchange with A. A can choose. B can't. When you have the low power, now you have two A's. So A can exchange with another A and another A, but that other A can exchange with the B, who's more likely to, there's some power dynamics, but the power is diluted to some degree because there's two A's. These two graph structures were also important because in sociology, triads and four cycle pockets in larger graphs seem to be important. So this paradigm for experiments, and I'll show you an experiment in a minute, that's what we're going to look at. In addition to just the network structure here, which is, this is very simplistic and small, but it's a different structure, um, the actual kind of exchange that happens, the logic, like what is the, so what is the context of an exchange? Is it we bargain and talk for a little while, which is a negotiated exchange. We have to negotiate. I offer you this, you offer me that. Now I don't agree. We keep going until we come to some agreement until I get a better deal. Or is it reciprocal where I offer you something or I ask for help and you either give it or not and nothing else happens. And then later at a later point in time, you might expect something back. So the temporal dynamics are a little bit different in addition to kind of a, to me, it's more of a temporal thing, but there's a pause and expectation building thing. So Christian and I saw these dynamics and John and Jim were interested in this and there's experimental work on this. So we went and found some experimental data from 2013 that studies negotiating the reciprocal exchange on these two graphs. And we developed an ACTAR model, the agent exchange behavior, and simulated the experimental conditions that were in experiments as precisely as we could. And then we compare the results to experimental data. This is what you do in psychology, except you don't necessarily have dyads and the task might be something different, but you have experimental data and you try to build a model that makes sense. And that's what we did. This is the actor model. You don't need to, we're not gonna go through any of these equations. This is an IBL model, same kind of model we were discussing earlier. And the model itself, I'll just describe it. And the, the actor model, what it does is, I think I'm just gonna go through the top. We might come back to this in a second. The model's encoding its past experiences in, in, in what we call chunks. It's how it forms memories. And in a chunk, just think of it as kind of a, a slot with things in it, some kind of useful things that for, for your task in the future. The name of your partner, which is this A1, A2, B1, B2, number of points that you've obtained from that partner, and when this happens, so there's a temporal component. So I'm not going to give you all the details, but whoever you're negotiating with, you have five tries. If there's four people, they're all trying at the same time. There's five rounds and so forth. We call them turns. 
and we're modeling within each turn is what this model does. So each agent generates an expectation of the points that could be requested from, from the agreements. So there's an expectation and that expectation is what IBL is doing. It's generating this from its past experience and it uses its expectation and matches it to its highest offer that's actually offered during each turn. It's trying to match its expectation based on its memory history from who it's traded with and what it expects. And then that's its decision logic. And it's completely embedded in the IBL framework, right? So I, we don't need to go to the details. It's exchange back and forth and act are, we, we came up with this way. I'll just make a point. There's many ways that you could take the ACTAR architecture and the IBL framework and build a model. You don't need to use expectations. You could, you could come up with something completely different. And we have an alternative that we might be working on too, but it's an important point in the sense that there's already, there's lots of decisions, even for a simple task like this, when you're building a cognitive model and you have to figure out what's best. So the results in summary, the empirical data in this graph is on the left. The simulation data is on the right. Just to summarize the empirical data, there's a clear network effect, which is you can see the four columns in the empirical data. The tag that's three or four, three or four, that's the number of nodes. So that's your graph effect. NEG is negotiated and REC is reciprocal. When you compare three and four, you basically get some decrease in the power effect a little bit. You can see this. So there's some graph effect. The exchange context itself was minor. So when you compare negotiated to reciprocal, that kind of exchange, not a lot of difference. But the main point here, the cognitive modeling perspective, our simple model in our first, this is, well, this is probably our second cut model, did pretty well. And that's the data on the right. In the same experiment, it did pretty well. This is just an example of taking a social, psychological, and sociological theory, building an ACTAR model, taking experimental data from humans, and matching it. And we have a lot, this is a, a brand new paper, so we have a lot of work to figure out what's going on here, but I thought I'd just show you the process. Okay, the next one is polarization of attitudes. What we mean by polarization is we mean networked polarization where groups and pockets of people start to think alike, maybe like an echo chamber or something of that nature. That's what we mean. Um, there's lots of ways to study it. And we wanted to study it from naturally a cognitive architecture perspective. And we have a, kind of a sociologist working with us, another sociologist here. He's not named there, sorry. This is a paper we just published in the Proceedings of the International Conference on Cognitive Modeling. The basic idea is we're gonna build a small agent-based model. It's, a, it's, base, it's just a graph. We have this IBL act up cognitive architecture that we built the model from. I'll tell you about the model in a second, but it's just a real simple, we change graph structure and I'll show you that in a second. But the, the idea is that people just look around and see what their friends have said. What are their friends, what kind of beliefs have their friends been pushing out? And they take that, all the beliefs of their friends and they process it. And I'll tell you the processing in a minute. And they come up with their own new belief and they spit that out to the world. So it's a social contagion kind of information diffusion approach, but it has this cognitive flavor. And in particular, we imbued this with a very particular kind of social psychological conceptualization or operationalization of attitude, which is that you have tokens or symbols that are having a valence associated with them. And valence is this good, bad distinction. Okay. And this, you know, it's a scalar between negative one and one and reflects something like how you feel about an aspect of something. So just for example, we were assuming a single attitude object. There's a group of people and it's, imagine it's Twitter and they're all talking about this one thing like Donald Trump or kitty cats or whatever, or COVID, it doesn't matter. And that's what they talk about. And there's beliefs associated with that. Each of the beliefs has a fixed narrative. So I said, cats scratch a lot. So you believe that scratching is bad. We all agree on that. It's a normative, valenced, symbol kind of system, okay, at the social level, if that makes sense. There's other ways to do it where valence changes for the symbol, but this is a, a pretty standard psychological way, a operationalization of this idea. So we use that idea, and then we just wanted to, what we're really interested in is how the distribution of valence with respect to the set of tokens or symbols, there's always 10 symbols in this system, okay? But we've varied experimentally. This is all experimental simulated synthetic data, nothing 
empirical with humans. But what we wanted to see, as you can see on the right here, we have the three panels. The top one's called centrist. It's all the little black uh, vertical lines with the circles on top, those tell you what the relation between each symbol and the fixed valence that value it has. So for centrist, they're centered around the middle. For linear, they're spread out evenly across the scale. And for polarized, you have five on each end because there's 10. And that's it. That never changes. If you have this symbol right here, someone just said this to you, it always has this negative 68, whatever it is, valence. This doesn't change. What changes is the distribution of these things in your social network. And that changes your attitude because your attitude is an accumulation of all this stuff. So that was one of the main points is to look at these distributions as, as ways of, you know, if you're Russia, for example, and you know the semantic space a group is in, you might try to change it by putting a whole bunch of things over here into the semantic space. That was the idea. Hope that makes sense. We changed network structure and some, some aspects of ACTAR, which I don't want to get into. What I want to talk about is the model itself, just, just so we see this cognitive part here, where it says simulation and operation of the cognitive model. So the way the simulation operated, this was discrete time, so there's 100 time steps. And for every time step, each of the agents took into their memory process, it's a, some kind of, just think of a memory buffer, it takes it in, and these are only people in their ego network that they're directly connected to. And it then uses two different ACTAR mechanisms, blended retrieval and matching, to basically generate one of the 10 tokens it's allowed to generate with the associated valence. And it does that by figuring out what its attitude is at the current time. And that's where the blended retrieval and the partial matching come in. What I want to point out, it's a very particular memory mechanism that comes from the architecture. It doesn't come from our model. Our model is more about the fact that we say people take all this stuff in memory, for example. Um, so it's an architectural piece. And, and that's really, I guess, one of the main points of this, this talk is to show that this is how you might actually go about. The link between the social simulation and the, and the cognitive piece is very direct and it's links right into the architecture. So anyway, we have different wiring topologies. This is a caveman here. And then we took the caveman and this is for different, different simulations. And we just rewired the caveman with a certain probability for every edge. When you have, this is 0.5, you can see there's still clustering, but it starts to break up pretty fast. 0.1 rewiring, this is one, you're around the graph. Our main measure for these simulations, we let them run for 100 time steps. We're measuring this, these three measures. One is called cognitive entropy, one's social entropy, and one's ego net entropy. It's using the same measure, it's just a different level of scale. One is within an individual agent's mind and their memory structure. One is across the whole graph called social entropy, and one is just within the ego net. Just think of this. So this is just the total number of bits is like 3.23 or something like that because there's up to 10 possibilities that you have held in memory or that you have in the social. Uh, these findings are too detailed, so I'm not going to give you too much. I think I just want to point out that we did, this is what the simulation looks like. We analyzed the simulations at the end of the time, at the end of the simulations, and we looked at patterns across memory decay, which is an ACTAR parameter, the rewiring probability, and then we looked at cognitive entropy, ego net entropy, and social entropy. And the one thing I just want to say in these results, uh, this isn't in the paper, this is stuff we're working on now, is, and I want to make this fast, I just want you to look at the left side here. This is all of the 18 conditions we have, or for each one of these conditions, you have ego net entropy and cognitive entropy. This is a scatter diagram of all the agents in the simulation. Yeah, there's probably 10,000 dots, but that's just because we ran lots of sims and replicates. Take any one of these cells here and take this cell right here and go over to here and you can see the difference. This is the attitudes of the agents. This is, they're very centrist here. They, this is at the end of all the simulation at the, the, the hundredth time step. Linear, you have this little polarization, but it's close and you have for polarized, you have polarized. It's just a frequency distribution of attitudes across all the agents. If you look at this row here, these three plots look very similar, especially this one here and this one here. They look very different here. They look very, right here, they look very different, but they're not really different. What's going on in terms of the ego net, which is the input or the stimulus and the cognitive, what's going on inside the mind of the agents is the same for both groups. It's just that if Mark's over here, it's just like he's right here. And if Mark's over here, it's just like he's right here. So it doesn't matter. The internals look different than the externals. That's the point here. So I think it's a really nice point to make and we're gonna explore this further. 
Why is this worthwhile? It's in silico because we can build experiments from these with real humans and we can build intuitions about observational systems like real systems like Twitter and social media. Maybe this will give us intuitions into what to look for and how to, how to leverage change because now we have access to the internals and the externals. Okay, now we're gonna get epidemics. So Baltazar is here. So if I screw this up, he's gonna bail me out. Okay. The first two slides are really his work and he's working with some colleagues at, at the Biocomplexity Institute and maybe elsewhere. And they have an economic model where they're assuming that the optimal contact rate um, at time T, there's a utility function that's built into the system that people are trying to maximize contacts. They want to have more contacts, but you know, that changes the um, progression of the epidemics and the prevalence rate. So this system figures out, okay, you want to maximize the number of contacts you can have, but you can't go too far because that's, if you have too many contacts, you're going to increase the prevalence. What we came up with, Balthasar was wondering, what if we had some kind of memory representation? So because his was instantaneous, it was just at a certain time, it would figure this out. And we wanted to figure out how to put memory in. So I suggested we think about using ACTAR. Um, you can see right here, now we have a memory window where you're, you take some past experience before you make the decision. And the ACT-R formulation goes like this. You have events that are discrete in a certain time window. When the disease prevalence reaches some threshold, say it's 50% or 30%, now it's an event. And we just assume that. We have one memory chunk in ACT-R and memory, very simple, that tracks the temporal signature of events. The activation of that chunk is tuned to the events. I'm going to show you a graph in a second. And what's important is the probability of retrieval is what we're going to take out of ACT-R of this chunk and put it right here. So this is a really little toy simulation. I've done, this is in Python. I don't even use, I just use some of the equations from ACT-R. So this is fresh off the press. I literally made this this morning. So um, don't hold us to this because we haven't quite figured out how to do all this, but this is an example of these are events. Okay. This is time. These are events. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine events in a hundred time steps. This is the activation of the single chunk. You can see it's activation values. Don't worry about the values, but it goes from negative to positive. And here's the probability of retrieval of that chunk over time. And a couple of things to point out, these curves between activation and probability of retrieval don't line up exactly. You want the probability of retrieval. That's what we get out. And somehow Balthasar is going to figure out how to put this into his model. There, and this is not published yet. This is in progress now, but I thought it would be of interest because it's from the epidemiological context. But as an example of a really simple ACTAR conceptualization. I don't even think you'd call this ACT. I mean, it's just, you know, it's ACTAR-like, but it does leverage the equations in, that match to lots of experimental data from humans over the last 30 years. We did social exchange, polarization, economic decisions, and epidemics. The takeaway is that our approach is to have a deep connection between social systems and the cognitive modeling and Sometimes the components that, that are interesting are the cognitive architecture. And we think that the, the cognitive architecture is fixed. So, I mean, this is their conjecture, if you want to call it that. But it, let's just assume it's fixed for a little while, for a year or two, and we're going to use that. What are the implications for understanding social systems? So, so there's a deep connection here. There's lots of things you could do with that connection, theoretically and practically speaking. And that's what this little suite of three systems was supposed to bring home. Two things, we're trying to go to scale, but the work is spread out amongst more people. So what, you, what do I mean by at scale? Well, there's really two objectives here. The first one is really social simulation on the left. I should reverse them. And the second one is some kind of belief map. That's what I call it, a belief map. Um, kind, of, kind of a dashboard of what people are thinking about at a certain point in time. Both might include simulation. I mean, the belief map might have some simulation behind it, but but the basic idea is to have a sense of what's going on in the population, and the simulation might give you more leverage into thinking about the future and alternatives and mitigations. And the dashboard is more towards the idea of situational assessment at the moment. This is, you know, the thing about the belief map. It's it's just about mental states. That's what it's about, and and behavior potentially. So. 
what I'm going to talk about now is this fully integrated version and where we are along this. I mean, it's, I don't know if you want to call it a pipeline. There's lots of little pipelines built into this vision, but there's three parts, information ecology, biological ecology. I just call it that. It's, I don't really like that name, but that's what we're going to call it today. Um, that's your contact networks, disease models, information ecology, social media, other kinds of media. And then the cognitive modeling piece, which is, we just saw a lot of cognitive modeling stuff, the architectures and the social and psychological theories and so forth. So one thing I'm going to comment on is that each of these squares here, they have their own simulation capabilities. Each one of the squares can represent different levels of scale, or you could harmonize all of them if you're integrating. Each one can have ground truth capabilities, because when I was trying to figure this out, I was thinking, well, if I have ground truth on the biological, anyway, not to confuse you because I, I sound confused, but the point is that you can think about the biological ecology as a state assessment, what's been happening in the past. And you can think about, you know, you might also have capabilities where you want to simulate any of these three alone. And there's relations between information and cognitive modeling alone. You don't need to go through this full integration. Biological ecology and cognitive modeling, for example, RT, taking that in as an input to a cognitive model. We've, I didn't show some of that work, but we were working on some of that too. So this is just kind of the larger vision that eventually I think you need to put all these three things together. And our institute now, in a sense, has parts of all three, which is nice. And there's lots of other people involved. And we're going to talk about these two pieces, the information ecology and the cognitive modeling. This is mainly work from the IARPA and the, the NSF RAPID. And the basic idea is we're looking at attitudes towards non-pharmaceutical interventions at the population level, modeling those from a cognitive perspective. And the cognitive models take in at this point, they're taking in informa the information ecology. That's that. So we're going to focus on those two parts. First, the information ecology this is media to cognition. That's because we're trying to figure out how to get aspects of social media as if they were inputs to a person that would change their beliefs that people could learn from and so forth. And people can produce things in these contexts. So the, there's lots of different kinds, but going from media to cognitive model to protective behavior or not protective behavior is, is one of the main threads. And also the biological ecology, in particular, RT or prevalence rates or case fatalities or something like that through the media into the cognitive model. A media is in a very broad sense. It could be a public health announcement. Okay. And of course, we aren't doing this work right now, but we used to, we've done a lot with DARPA, which is the media and the cognitive model, which is the, where the behavior itself is behavior on the media, like tweeting. That's another aspect that we won't address today, but it's out there. So there's lots of ways to think of this information ecology and its relation to cognition. Right now, we have three methods that we've been developing with respect to taking mainly Twitter and mainstream media and trying to extract something that the cognitive model could take into. One's called sense detection. The other's called it's provisionally called directed topic-based sentiment. And the third one is community level knowledge graphs. We're going to just talk about sense detection in the interest of time. On the right though, just to so show you, each one of these has its own pipeline. This is a pipeline for the community level knowledge graph. This is Fan Chao Meng's work and he's just probably in the room. As you can see, it's quite complicated and we're just starting to get some papers out on this. So. Anyway, there's a lot of different pipelines that you could build to, to try to tackle these, this, this larger problem of integration across these three areas. So just to give you a flavor of stance detection, this works from a paper that was just at the um, Proceedings for the Florida Artificial Intelligence Research Society. It's called stance detection. This is a bunch of NLP folks. This is part of our IRPA work. And they're the NLP group in that project. And they take in social media, and also we use what's called Chiron data, which comes from um, the little news blips on the bottom of the TV that tell you what this, basically like a ticker tape, takes those in. What it does is it generates these things called stances. So up at the top, you have this example, wearing a mask probably protects me. And it gets more com much more complicated as you can imagine on Twitter, but it takes every sentence it can find in a tweet and it generates this thing called a stance, which is a belief category protect, what's called a trigger, or you could have a predicate content, which would be a predicate argument, 
and then it has this belief strength, which is what's, what's the chance that this person actually endorses this belief, positive or negative. So it goes 2.5 is pretty positive. Two, negative 2.5 is that this person doesn't believe that. And they have lots of sophisticated NLP methods to try to disambiguate belief or not using negation and other things. And, and, and finally, sentiment. And then it computes an attitude, which is its sentiment and it's a particular kind of sentiment. This paper here, uh, there's a there's a link here if you, when you get these slides, but it's the paper that's referenced down here it has the details. It provides an attitude, and the the work itself is in the NLP domain, and, and they have their own objectives in that domain with respect to accuracy and so forth, and comparisons to SOA. So the, the trick is, and I'm going to show you in a moment, Actar's attempt to take this in. We haven't quite figured it out yet what Actar is going to do. This is the pipeline. So this is what you get out of this, this single pipeline. We have two other ones. Um, and the point of, of pointing this out is that there's lots of pipelines you can make. If you're taking the information ecology into a cognitive model, there's a lot of work to be done to get anything that's even recognizable by a cognitive model. And this is a symbolic kind of thing. You can do non-symbolic stuff too, if you wanted to, and the cognitive model could take that in under certain kind of conditions. And this is the, one of the approaches we're using now. And I'll show you in a moment how we're going to do that or attempt to, but we haven't done it yet. We've done simpler things. So I want to move now to the, the cognitive modeling that we're doing in respect to this large scale integration. And now we're going to look towards attitudes, MPIs. This is a really important piece of this, this presentation, which is the building of a cognitive model, which you see here, when you start with the cognitive architecture and what our approach is to this, because this stuff in the middle is where a lot of the work, most of the work is. And I'll just add that you need feedback from the larger simulation context, but you don't start there because you don't have the simulation built yet because you don't have the agent built. But we start with the model building. We have theory enrichment. We have to figure out the theories we need from social psychology and so forth. But we have to define the task. What are we doing with the information ecology? What are we doing with the, inf the biological ecology, if anything? So let's start there. And then we're going to go into model testing and model refinement very quickly. So we use the theory of reasoned action. It maps well. This is a social psychological theory. If you don't know about it, that's okay. But it's very, I'll just say popular. I'm not going to say it's good or bad. I've used it in the past um, in other projects. It does have a lot of experimental data tied to it. It's really never been modeled from a, a deep cognitive architecture perspective, but we're trying and this is what it looks like. So this is gonna be highly abstract, but what, what you see on the right is really these little memory slots in ACT-R. And we have three kinds of ways of thinking we've been thinking about, and we started modeling ACT-R in this certain way, which is, one is just looking at your pro and anti mask and the frequencies. How many wear, don't wear things are you seeing from social media in the information ecology? Another one is to, in your memory representations, you add some information that captures effective or maybe valenced information. So they're affect associated with the statements that they make. And the third one is adding another piece of information to the memory representation that actually captures something about the relation of the risk that you assume or predict and what you actually experience and learning from that experience. So this is IBL, it's the same ACTAR stuff. It's just trying to map on to, how do you take the information ecology and map it onto these simple little chunk things in this memory thing? That sounds funny, but it's, it's really hard. So, cause you have to, I mean, there's lots of reasons it's hard, but you get the point. So that, that's the technical piece. That's what we're trying to do with the model building there. Since I have like two minutes left, I'm going to go to the model testing. I'm just going to make one point here. I'm going to show you one graph. We're just testing the idea that the attitude model that, we're, that I just showed you, one of those representational methods can take in hashtags and look at just the frequencies of positive and negative hashtags with respect to mask wearing and look at whether or not the trajectory of a single ACTAR model representing a whole state. This is four different ACTAR models, each representing a state, trying to capture the, the pro anti hashtag dynamics over time in those states from Twitter. And we try to match the predictions and the actuals with our ACTAR models predict and the actuals. It's, and the reason I point this out, it's kind of a crazy thing to do because 
it's so high level, but this is what you do when you start building. The point I'm trying to make is when you're building these models for the larger scale sims, you have to start with these really simple kind of approaches to get some purchase on what you're doing. So I don't really have much more time, but this is more about Actar and how you build this cognitive model and where we are. This piece, we're not to the model refinement yet. We're still working on this. So the closing thoughts, I just wanted to say, the framework was, you know, I probably went too long in the beginning with the framework, but I always think about this stuff and compare different approaches and think about how do we really get evidence for human behavior using different approaches? Because the approaches for, for building evidence is going to be different and dependent on the approach. I mean, that seems obvious, but it's not really, you know, if you look at the, the large space of social stimulation in general, that's there's not enough principled discussion amongst different approaches, I don't think. The examples of small systems show you really what an architecture can do and what we mean by that. And it also shows you that ODE style kinds of things, we can integrate cognitive modeling simplistically. And that's the work that both of and I are working on. And then just to take home, you know, this, this pipeline, it's really, we're just carving out little pieces of it, um, this large scale vision that we're envisioning, but it's information, the cognition to behavior in the epidemiological context. NLP is very important. There's lots of design issues and scientific issues, and I haven't even scraped the surface, but I'm hoping in the next 10 years that we will have systems like this in place. And with that, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mark, uh, for a great talk. So, Mark, thanks for the really interesting talk. In your network, uh, the, the second topic on network polarization. Uh, so mm -hmm. sometimes uh, this polarization is clustered in a network, right? Mm -hmm. So does that, uh, what, what role does that have on the results you should? So do you, do you mean that you'll have clusters of polarization or that you'll have... Yeah. Right, you so mean nodes it? have co correlated ideologies with the yeah, okay so you have some kind of assortativity within a cluster yeah. right mm -hmm. yeah so so we see that in our our model so if you let our model run if you if you decrease the the clustering enough cuz we're just rewiring that that caveman graph right you get to a point where at about maybe 50 or 60% rewire maybe maybe 45 or somewhere around there you just get everybody in the whole group to be the same Okay. If there's an area where up to about rewire of, it's about 25%. Okay. That, that, that probably 25, uh, 0.25 for, for rewire where the clustering, you see exactly what you're saying, which is groups sticking together, but it's just the phenomenon that you see. If you let them all blend together, they all act the same. There is an interesting thing I didn't have time to show, which is that the one condition that we call linear, which is when you equally space the, you fix the valences to equally space intervals from negative one to one across all the clusters that you have, even in the caveman group, when a full caveman, all the clusters have the same narratives. You don't get heterogeneity in narratives, which you don't necessarily expect because you think, well, this group doesn't talk to this group. So why don't they just end up over, because we do the thousands of simulations, why don't they just end up with different narratives and you get a distribution? You don't get a distribution. You get the same ones. It's because the geometry related to the, the way we initialize it to the agents has this normal distribution around it. So you end up with those equal space, the three in the middle or so always get picked and for all clusters. It's kind of a social engineering problem. But yeah, no, that's a really good question. And that's something I didn't have the time to go into because that paper takes a while to explain. I think that's one of the, in terms of design and changing population behavior, there's a relation between, it's really, between, what's interesting to me, um, and I don't have the math worked out yet, but you, you could prove it probably or some come close to it, that the, the mechanism we pick in this blending procedure, which is part of the memory retrieval thing, we made a, some decisions of what that was going to do. You can change its way of using similarity that you might not get that effect. I'm not certain of that, but the point is that the internal cognitive piece may have implications for these kind of clustering dynamics. And if that's true, we should know that. And maybe that's either something you can manipulate. I don't, I don't know, but, but to me, that shows the, the relation across the levels of scale. And I think that's interesting and useful, hopefully. Thanks. I mean, there's lots of these things, so I'm just going to make a couple of different kinds of examples. There's cognitive dissonance kinds of things and balance theory that are sort of traditional ways to understand linkages between people. And there's 
influencing friends and family. <laughs> Right, right. There's things like inoculation of ideas. These old experiments where they train people, um, like, I don't know, they train people that, I don't know, the Russian space program is no good. They show them lots of articles and papers and stuff on the theme about how the Russian space science program is no good. And in one group, they also hear that uh, maybe ours isn't as good as we thought it was either. And maybe theirs is better than we know and there's stuff. So they put moderating information in and one and in the other, but they both come up with an example what people think. In both cases, they say the Russian space program is no good, but in subsequent information that they get, they behave differentially. The ones that got, you know, this other information, mm -hmm. you know, this sort of a thing. I mean, I, I, these are really old. There's nothing novel about what I'm saying. But that and balance theory and other kinds of things like that, I just, when I see all these other sort of methods and stuff associated with like uh, sticking things together, there's lots of extant uh, sort of social psychological boundary research. And, and it just seems like a lot of the, effect, you know, I don't know if these are mechanisms that you put in your effects that you measure, but it just seems like uh, I don't see them. And it, I don't understand why I don't see them. Yeah. Well, that, I think it's a really good point. I think the, the first thing that comes to mind is the last six or eight months, I've gotten much more involved with, with ACT-R and actually starting to try to figure out if I, if I wanted to start to bring it in as part of my toolkit. But really, a lot of detailed discussions about the, the, like we just talked about balance theory in the context of social exchange and balance theory as potentially really a prisoner's dilemma problem. And what stri strikes me about this, and Christian Labierre has a lot of experience, you know, what, I mean, he's, he has this weird approach. It's like he just comes out with a model that's as simple as possible in general. And when you, the relation between, say, balance theory as a description from a paradigm, for example, and a set of results that are associated with it and some kind of ideas about why the paradigm and the results turn out the way they do, into this idea of the cognitive architecture, which let's just pretend it's fixed just for argument's sake. The, the problem of building a model, I think cognitive modelers, if you put 10 into 10 different rooms, you'd have three different models and they might all do similarly as well against the empirical data. Maybe they don't all do perfectly, but they all do pretty well. Then what? I mean, this is, I, I mean, I, I hear what you're saying. I think that it is important to try to get these kinds of, I don't know if, like you said, if you want to call them mechanisms or phenomena, but and it, because they have the potential for impacting large scale behaviors and structures, but we're stuck with this problem. I mean, you've said it before, I forget what you call it, but you build three different models for the same thing and they all kind of work well. And the architecture didn't even change. It's just the strategies that you use to build your model. That's a lot of detail and, and decisions to make. So I don't know how you solve that problem, but I agree with you 100%. They're important. So thank you for the comment. It was a long presentation. There's a lot of things we could talk about. We should talk. Yeah, yeah it's Okay, good. thank you. Okay, well, since we're over our 1230 time, just want to close it out here. And thanks again to Mark for a great presentation today. And thanks everybody for joining us. We'll see thanks you next time. Thanks for listening. Time. Please reach out if you want to have questions. I appreciate it. Thanks, Mark, for doing this. Appreciate it. No, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Bye. Hi, everyone. Okay, bye-bye.